Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another episode of ACNS webinars. I would like to inform that this is the 199th episode of ACNS webinars, and next week we'll be airing the 200th episode. So the speaker for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from USA, Professor Maria Selda Paris. Professor Paris Selda is an associate professor of neurosurgery at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. And she's also the director of neurosurgical and skull-based surgical anatomy program at Mayo Clinic. She specializes in complex brain and skull-based tumors and the neurosurgical cranial conditions. She is devoted to offer an individualized treatment to each patient, including open, minimally invasive, and endoscopic techniques in order to maximize surgical resection and achieve surgical goals, preserving quality of life. She did her two-year fellowship with Dr. Albert Rotten in microsurgical and endoscopic anatomy, as well as clinical neurosurgical skull-based fellowship at the Mayo Clinic. She worked as a staff at the Albany Medical Center in Albany, New York for two years and joined the skull-based neuro-oncology team in Mayo Clinic, Rochester. We are extremely honored to have her today at our webinars and today she'll be talking about surgical anatomy research and skull-based surgery, the positive feedback. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from Taiwan, Jimmy Ming Zheng Chuang. Professor Jimmy is attending staff, assistant professor of neurosurgery department of Kaohsiung Changgung Memorial Hospital and Changgung University College of Medicine, Kaohsiung, Taiwan. He is also the chair of neuro-oncology team, Kaohsiung Changgung Memorial Hospital. He was a previous fellow with Professor Frederick Book and Professor Ali Christ. His clinical interests are focused primarily upon neuro-oncology and we are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today we will be talking about a surgeon's view of neuropathologic diagnostic odyssey for 2021 WHO CNS tumor update. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest from Brazil, Professor Luis Baba. Professor Baba is the Professor and Chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, Evangelic Medical School, Curitiba Federal University of Paraná, Curitiba, Brazil. He is also the Professor Honoris Cusa, Sechino Medical School, Moscow, Russian Federation. He was the past President of the Brazilian Neurosurgery Society and currently serves as Chairman of the WFNS Education Society. He was the President of the World Skull Based Society at Rio in 2022. We are extremely honored today by his presence in our webinars and sincerely thank him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Marius Selda Paris. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the distinguished faculty, Professor Suresh Nair, to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today, and with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Louis Bova. Good morning, good evening for the people from Japan, from our Asia. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you for this outstanding job, now 199. Maybe next will be the 200 is an is amazing achievement, amazing achievement. And especially Professor Yoko Kato, that she's doing a wonderful job. She did it many, many, many years and continue doing this wonderful job for the neurosurgeons, for the young neurosurgeons, in keeping the real neurosurgery alive. The, the neurosurgery that we live, the neurosurgery that we love, and she's make us happy in, uh, keeping this webinar every week. And how can I say about our next speaker? She's a neurosurgeon. She's very smart. She studied anatomy. She's following the legacy, the legacy of Professor Al Rotten. She's doing the all, everything that she learned in the lab. See, it's our dream as a neurosurgeon. In, in, as a dream as educator. Our idea is to train neurosurgery is to take a guy that you go to the lab, learn the anatomy, learn the way to do it, and after that, go to do the case. This is the ideal way of, the ideal way of training. We, we are very happy to see the, the work that Dr. Sheldon is doing in Rochester, in the work that she learned from Professor, from Professor Al Rotten, in his background from Spain, that he moved to yes, and to show the success, the real American dream. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for all your efforts, the time you are taking us. I'm very pleased and very honored to be here to watch your presentation. I'm here to listen. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Borba. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation from the ACN Congress. It's really a true honor to be here. Dr. Borba is a master surgeon and as a master educator. Uh, thank you very much for your kind words. So today we're going to talk about uh, the surgical anatomy research, education, and how we apply that to skull-based surgery, and what I call the positive feedback. So I was very, uh, really honored and privileged to uh, work with Dr. Roten for two years as a fellow uh, in my career. And I, I learned many, many things, not only from Dr. Roten, but from my colleagues, from my mentors, from my mentees, uh, from my students. And I'm going to share with you a few of these concepts. So the objectives of the talk are to talk about the background, why and what is surgical anatomy? What are the objectives? How is research performed? And how can we apply that directly to cases? So surgery in a few words is the pathology with distorted anatomy and hemostasis. So that's a simplified way to look at surgery. And one of the main parts is the anatomy, it's because it's the roadmap that we take to remove lesions and to take out tumors, to clip aneurysms, et cetera. So the anatomical knowledge that is relevant to surgery, we can find it in books, we can find it in talks, which are important, but it is very important to have hands-on dissection. And the goal, as Dr. Rotten defined it, is to make surgery more accurate, gentle, and safe. And what I, that means, and that has been studied since, you know, it goes back to the Hippocratic principle that we have to abstain from doing harm, the primum non nocere, which is the harm can be made intentionally, which is maleficence. And that's completely against medical practice. But they're also harmed from lack of knowledge or training, which ha may have the same result, although not the same intention, but still harm. So how do we minimize or how do we, do we avoid that harm? So Dr. Roten, as you all know, said many times, you know, emphasized, and that's why we are talking here about, about surgical anatomy because of Dr. Roten, that the best neuronavigation is really the knowledge of the anatomy in the mind of the neurosurgeon. And we use neuronavigation and I use it every day, but still, you know, that doesn't mean that you don't have to, you cannot substitute that knowledge with the neuronavigation, for instance. We work in tiny places. We work with delicate structures. We're taking the wrong road by one or two millimeters can make extraordinarily great damage. We want to expose the necessary structures for the operation. The time to expose the structures that are behind uh, the pathology or besides the pathology and are not necessary is not the surgical uh, room. It is the anatomical lab. So that is where we can explore the anatomy. That's where we can learn the anatomy and know not only just case after case. So then because I work at the Mayo Clinic and these institutions holds very high values about, you know, it's the surgical uh, training and training medicine training in general. Uh, the Mayo brothers said, you know, anatomy and physiology will again grow in importance and sleeping topics directly concerning disease. They were both surgeons and that was what well, was very important to them. And more, imp more importantly, most importantly, I would say that there's no excuse today for the surgeon to learn on the patient. It was not back then, still not now. So the goals of surgical anatomy research and education are to have familiarity with structures, have the sensation of deja vu, something that we have already seen before, something we are comfortable and we are familiar with. We want to have what Dr. Rotten said is the X-ray see-through vision. 
So what is behind this another cell? What is behind this finite sinus? There's the dura, and those are the anatomical structures. Although we don't have to expose these anatomical structures, we need to know in our mind that they are behind us. And the tumor may go to one, involve one or two or all of them. So we need to anticipate what is behind without looking at it. And that is what uh, surgical anatomy gives you. And it gives you also the three-dimensional anatomy, the three-dimensional you know, uh, organization of structures, because that is what makes neuroanatomy so complex because it's not plane after plane, it's rather a spherical structure, the, the structures in the head, and, and it's difficult to orient ourselves many times. And that's why we need to emphasize uh, surgical anatomy. And then we also want to, want to find new ways to perform surgery, take new routes, describe new techniques, describe you know, minimally invasive approaches, et cetera. So in, in con concretely, neurosurgery and skull base, uh, you know, have very uh, important details that, are, that make it really complex. And so it's even more important to know the anatomy because of the complexity of the structures, because of the different views, because we opened a completely new corridor a few years ago with the endoscopic procedures, and we had to retrain and relearn the anatomy that we knew before. And it's the same anatomy, but has a different structure. And also, I'm going to show this repetition and learning curve. This is, has been very, uh, this is really something that has been known for decades. And how we learn, how human beings learn, is we have the number of repetitions here. And this is the performance. To, so to get 100% performance, which we can get close to it, we never have 100%, but uh, we have, with the number of repetitions, we have a slow beginning where we you know, are not very good at a task. And then we have a steep progress with more repetitions until we get a plateau and achieving mastery of that procedure. So that can be applied all to, to surgical skills. The more cases we have, the more experience we have and the performance will be higher. But what if we can decrease the number of performances in the OR to get a master level with surgical anatomy? So that's what surgical anatomy is about. We want to decrease our learning curve in the OR and, and kind of translate that learning curve as much as we can to our harmless environment that is the surgical, the, the surgical anatomy lab. And then also it's important to know how we forget newly learned information. So we have, when we first learn, we forget, you know, in about a day, most of it, and in three days, the great majority of the information. Whereas where we review that, then our retention gets closer and closer and closer to 100%. So we want to repeat the tasks as many times as we can in the surgical anatomy lab. So that's why I can say with all confidence that before and after I trained in surgical anatomy, I was a completely different surgeon. So, why surgical learning? Surgery is never a hundred percent controlled environment, and that is a fact. So we can control the spatial orientation, the X-ray, X-ray see-through vision. We can control our master of, um, you know, an approach or a procedure with repetition of procedures and steps. And we want to look carefully at the preoperative studies with anatomical variations that we need to know that they exist to look for them and why they are important and how the pathology distorts the anatomy and displaces the structures. And then we have non-controlled um, events in surgery because it's surgery and are non-predictable events and patient variables. 
But so we want to have more control than no control over an operation. And this is really what we can control. And we need to make sure that the balance goes towards the control more than the not control variables. So why 3D teaching? Why Dr. Rowe don't emphasize the 3D, uh, the 3D teaching as a way to learn surgical anatomy? Because in 2D, we have an imaginary versus a real distance or near real distance and dimensions. And the 3D images, they help. But what ultimately helps even more is the dissection. As much as you can, because the 3D images can help, but they're not a substitute for real life dimensions and distances. And that is something that is very difficult to teach. And even with virtual reality, still very difficult to teach. So what do I call the positive feedback? So the positive feedback means that the more you learn, the more you need to learn, because you have really no final frontier in surgical anatomy education. You will never master 100% of any task because there are variables. And even in, in surgical anatomy, I could see when Dr. Roten, I was training with Dr. Roten, he would be surprised from time to time of an anatomical detail that he had not realized in the past. And he became really excited about that. And this comes back to the principle that Socrates already said years and years ago that, you know, centuries ago, that the more I know, the more I realize I know nothing. And this is, um, this, is, this is true for every activity, and this is true also for surgery. So I think that the teacher and the pupil both learn from every project. And we have unknown important details that lead to other questions. And many, many times we're in the OR and we realize, well, I should look at this in the lab because I really don't know how this anatomy is arranged in this particular case. And from the, from the OR is where the projects in the lab come to life because we have questions that we need to answer clinically. So I, I like to give uh, my fellows freedom of thinking is uh, something that Dr. Roten really emphasized. And with Dr. Roten lab as a model, we have, uh, and this is a picture of, uh, from Dr. Roten's lab when I was there, have fellows from different backgrounds. We had directed freedom and imagination and creativity to answer the questions we had. And we had a, a long process of preparation. And the first three months at Dr. Roten's lab, we could only do, uh, we're just to get the technique of pictures and dissections. So what we are doing now at the Mayo Clinic, and we recently established the Roten uh, Neurosurgery and Ortholaryngology program in conjunction with the Department of Anatomy, and this is located, it's a program, so it has different locations. So in Rochester, concretely, we have, we work at the Stable Laboratory, and we work also at St. Mary's Laboratory, which is a training laboratory. And <clears throat> this is following Dr. Roten's legacy. So he left more than 100 fellows who, with their own fellows and residents, are going to teach exponentially other residents and fellows. So he achieved his primary goal that was that every second of every day, a patient would benefit from his teachings, either directly or indirectly. And this goes back to patient safety and this goes back to the Hippocratic principle. So how we established a surgical anatomy program, uh, we focused on residency training and it's a task result model we have uh, for, from PGY1 to PGY4, they are scheduled to do a number of dissections every year and they get scored from, you know, with each dissection. We also have research fellowships and we have, right now we have five fellows and, and we have short training periods in which, you know, people from internationally and nationally come here for a stay of two to four weeks 
to just dissect with a scheduled program. And then we have our three uh, to five day courses, the CME credits, and we prepare also for the neuroanatomy exam uh, for residency. So in order to get pictures uh, like this, which is a, shows a very intricate anatomy or like this, we, uh, we published not, not too long ago, a paper in which we describe what we did at Dr. Rotten's lab and what we learned as well, as far as the step-by-step -step preparation. So in this paper you will find, and that was published in uh, the Journal of Skull Base, every detail to set up a surgical anatomy laboratory with the quality of injection and the quality of dissection uh, that Dr. Rotten taught us. And this starts with, you know, a very careful preparation of flushing of the specimen, uh, injection, and we describe exactly what we use for the cannulation, for the injection. And the goal is to allow everyone in the world to have access to these techniques. And also how we take 3D pictures. It's a long process of taking 3D pictures that is taken with a 2D camera. And we slide the camera and we take one image for the right eye and one image for the left eye. And actually right now, what we do is we combine, it's even a little bit more complex. We combine three different exposures uh, with a special program to get this final image. So that would be six pictures for the right eye I'm sorry, uh, three pictures of the right eye and three pictures from the left eye that combined are gonna give us one 3D image. So we went over also uh, through the, how to take 3D pictures with the endoscope and it's just displacing slightly and rotating the endoscope. And a lot, one of the uh, most common questions that I get asked when I go to a meeting is how do you project? How do you, what do you use to project in 3D? And we put that in a PowerPoint and we, uh, we describe, you know, nowadays we have 3D TVs, we have the uh, silver screen, the two projectors. So we describe for every single format how you can uh, arrange your pictures and how you can project and uh, everything. So this is something that Dr. Rotten really wanted to, um, to share with the world. And this is uh, one of our main uh, goals as well, to teach as many uh, people as possible. And how do we get pictures? Uh, and this is from our lab. How do we get pictures that look clean and really display the anatomy. So there's a technique to that. And uh, by doing that very carefully, very meticulously, because this is the way that the surgical anatomy really stands out and we can you know, realize how the structures are related to one another. If we have a clean, nice um, anatomical dissection where we can really identify you know, uh, clearly the structures. And then we also add uh, in many of the projects now an assistant, either an assisted view or the main view with the endoscope, because it's becoming a tool that we use basically every day in the OR. Even in open cranial cases, uh, there are some, in some cases, you may need to look around the corners. And it's very important to, to know how to use the endoscope which is completely different technique if you're using it as an assisted case in an open case, or you're using it in an endonasal case. Because in an open case, you need to be very careful when putting the endoscope because it goes between the nerves. So you need to make sure that you are looking at all times at where the shaft or your endoscope is, is, is going to be. Because if you are looking here and then you move your endoscope slightly, you can really damage the nerves that are behind you. So what are the goals of the lab? What are the goals of the surgical anatomy? So one is to advance the field. And for that, we have research fellows and the residents. And also the other big part of this lab is to train residents and fellows. And that goes back and to the principle of repetition and 
looking at the 3D anatomy and dimensions. So how do we integrate the surgical anatomy in uh, open skull-based surgery, for instance? So uh, here, what we went through, and these are papers that are either published, accepted, or in submission uh, in the Journal of Skull Base, we have gone through our most used approaches in skull base and done a step-by-step -step surgical approach for trainees. And it has been quite a popular collection because we want to uh, describe step-by-step -step what uh, we do and why we do that in the OR. And we think that this is completely reproducible and the trainees uh, can go back to the lab and try to reproduce those steps and learn that way. We also study uh, anatomical variations, for instance, in the middle clinoid, you know, that's very important, not only for open cases, but also for endoscopic cases, because it's closely related to the carotid artery. And we need to know those anatomical variations when we operate in that area. So when we have a tumor like this, and the goal is to have the trainees would have in their mind exactly what they are going to face when uh, we do a tumor like this, you know, exactly, you know, the carotid, the optic canal and all the important uh, anatomical structures to get a, a, a safe resection or a tumor like this and what kind of approach uh, we would use for a tumor like this. So I think it's extremely important to go back between the cases and the surgical anatomy. And for instance, in like this recurrent craniopharyngioma, what we were more worried about were the lenticular straight arteries, for instance, that are exactly there. And when we took the patient back to the OR with a subtotal resection, there's a little residual here, but with a safe resection, the patient uh, was neurologically intact. So that's what we want. We want safe, maximal safe resections. Then another part of our practice that has been helping tremendously to look at the anatomy of the pathology in particular is the 3D uh, virtual reality and the 3D printing. And we are very lucky to have uh, at our disposal, you know, the 3D uh, printing laboratory here at Mayo, where we can see that, you know, a tumor like this that involves the uh, superior sagittal sinus, it's, it's vital to know exactly how these veins that are carrying most of the uh, collateral flow because this, uh, the, the sinus is completely occluded at that point, where are they going, how we can manage to uh, save those vessels that are um, critical uh, for the success of the operation. Or tumors like this, when we are deciding, this is a vitreous schwannoma, when we are deciding whether we do that uh, endoscopically with transmaxillary assistance, or we do that uh, uh, through an, in, you know, an open approach. Uh, so this is, um, we've done a number of those with endoscopic uh, assisted with transmaxillary approach. And also cases like this. So this is a, a specimen we, we dissected we combine that with CT scan, and then we get the 3D printing, uh, which tells us exactly what we did uh, in, the, in the anatomy lab. So we are going back and forth between clinical uh, and um, dissection and OR, et cetera. So other projects that are important, uh, for instance, uh, an example of a project that will make us be more accurate in um, in knowing which arteries we can potentially sacrifice, such as like the subarcuit artery and the differentiation and the location um, of the labyrinthine artery that uh, we want to preserve. So this is an, another study uh, that came from the lab with this, uh, you know, anatomical variations of those arteries and applied to the surgical anatomy. So these are projects that were done all by the fellows that we're answering a question of that came in the OR. So for instance, a tumor like this, what we want to integrate, uh, so this is a hemangioblastoma, uh, a patient in his 40s who had hydrocephalus and uh, as Sean was placed at an outside hospital and was sent to Mayo for a resection of the tumor. 
So ended up being a hemangioblastoma. And we did an angiogram uh, with uh, preoperative embolization. And this is the mold of the uh, surgical anatomy, basically, of uh, this case, in which we see that pica is the main contributor, uh, but in its very distal branch. And that's what they could embolize uh, right here. So, but it's very important to know exactly what the 3D anatomy of this particular case is. Uh, and then we com if we combine that uh, with the surgical views that uh, the anatomy gives us. Uh, so this is uh, from a paper we just published about the far lateral step-by-step. -step. And we can see that, so this is the condyle and we can see the extradural and the intradural image. And it's critical that we take this part here, which is not part of the condyle, which will not give st instability to the patient, but it's going to give us much more uh, view, compare this to this intradural view, if we take it out uh, as, as compared if we don't. So here we can see an uh, anatomical view, a little bit obstructed, and here a really nice view of the 11th cranial nerve, but we still didn't drill the condyle. And then if we compare drilling partially the condyle, it does not give much more added visibility, but sometimes we need to do it. Sometimes we need to drill the condyle, but we try to be as conservative as possible having the maximal uh, surgical view. So this is a surgical view uh, this is a short video just to illustrate how we can translate what we find in the surgical anatomy lab uh, to the OR. So in the upper corner, you can see a dissection with, uh, without drilling the, uh, uh, the occipital condyle, just getting that um, little corner uh, above the, um, the condyle. And here we are uh, trying to dissect the tumor and we can see the rootlets of the first uh, cervical of C1 and we can see the lower cranial nerves. So this is coagulating and uh, dividing the tumor. And we want to see uh, here how we can really correlate and what we have to look for when we uh, perform this approach. So we have to know that we're going to find pica here that is coming into view. Uh, we know that there is the final end of pica that's gonna uh, end in the tumor. And here uh, I'm coagulating uh, some of the uh, little branches that are feeding this tumor. It's a, a very vascular tumor. It's a solid hemangioblastoma. And then at the end, we are going to see that the surgical anatomy and the uh, postoperative view have to really match. So this is what we uh, tell our trainees that um, they need to, to be aware of and they need to anticipate with the X-ray see-through vision. So this is the vertebral artery here. This is spike and we see the medulla. And we can see that it's almost exactly the same view as we can see in the surgical anatomy lab. So that's why it's extremely important to have this X-ray see-through vision and anticipate what you're going to find. So this is the post immediate post-op uh, with cross total resection. So what did we? How can we apply the surgical anatomy in endoscopic scope with surgery? So endoscopic scope surgery made us learn the same anatomy from a completely different structure. And when we are faced with the sphenoid sinus, then we need to have very clearly in our mind what we are looking at and what, it, what corresponds to the intracranial anatomy. And when we do that, we see that the limbus of the sphenoid no, is the upper part of, this are the optic canals, where the tuberculum is, is the attachment of the diaphragm intracranially, and is the tuberculum recess just above the cella. The pregasmatic sulcus in between the optic canals 
optic canals here is this area here. So we need to have in our mind that this is the cella, this is the carotid, but where are the other structures uh, in this view? And where is, for instance, our middle clinoid? Uh, our middle clinoid is in the middle C of the carotid in the nasally, and it's going to be just posterior and sometimes joining as a carotical clinoid ring, the anterior clinoid process. So all these anat anatomical variations are extremely important and we need to see them before surgery at all, if all possible, in our preoperative studies. So in a surgery like this that we performed and I performed endonasally, we need to have in our mind, our trainees need to learn that we are operating in this area and we are looking at these, the optic chias, the, uh, the small little chiasmatic branches and the ACAs, for instance, and all this arachnoid in the supradiaphragmatic space. So that's what we need to have in mind when we operate in this area and something like this too, like a craniopharyngioma. So in this case, this is P2, and we needed to leave a small remnant of tumor. This is the pituitary stock. This is the optic chias, because it was around the perforating arteries that we can't here that we can sacrifice. So tumors like this, uh, like this uh, pituitary adenoma, knowing exactly what uh, you know we have to look for. So in this case, we opened. So these are the optic canals. So we drilled uh, the tuberculum recess and we drilled part of the planum. We did not open the dura there, but we wanted to have maneuverability because this is a, a large tumor. So in order to be able to, uh, to dissect and careful was quite a firm tumor, carefully remove that tumor. And this is looking uh, with 45 degree endoscopes. We're seeing that the last pieces of tumor come down with the diaphragm. And it's important to have that extra uh, maneuverability rather than solid bone to be able to uh, retract gently the dura and uh, remove the tumor. So this is the diaphragm and this is the, uh, the pituitary gland uh, completely thinned out by this tumor. And this is the reconstruction in this case with a free mucosal graft. The patient ended up uh, doing really well uh, with a, a gross total resection. So if we go beyond the cella in surgical anatomy, and this is a paper that we just, was just published in, in ACTA, I was, we were wondering what's the key point or the key area in the endoscopic supracellar area. And, and we believe that the key area is the precasmatic sulcus, which is between both optic nerve prominences and above the cella. So this gives you really great access to all this anatomy and the supracellar cisterns, because if we do a selective craniotomy here, and that doesn't mean that we do that for the surgical cases, we just wanted to see what was the axis that this key area gave us. And this is the axis that it, it gives us. This gives access to the supracasmatic area and the infracasmatic area. The supracasmatic area with the ACAs, the infracasmatic area, we're gonna see exactly that goes to the uh, interpedicular fossa and these are the posterior clinoids. So you can really reach this area and that's what we use very commonly for craniopharyngiomas. So it's important to know the anatomy that you can access exactly through this area because this is the key part, not the only part, but is the key part of the approach to the supracellar areas. So something that we also want in the lab is to look at, you know, what are the ways in we can we can minimize the uh, resection of normal structures. So for a tumor in a patient anosmic like this, and we can debate open cranial versus endoscopic. And in this case, uh, for tumors like this, if we were to uh, choose an endoscopic approach, uh, 
we want to minimize the trauma to the nose. And that's what we studied in, in, the, uh, in the lab. We translated that to the OR to see if we can minimize the trauma to the nose rather than doing the standard approach in red, doing performing the green approach that we call the superior ethmoidal approach. And this is gonna show you that um, the final view uh, basically. So, so in here we go above the middle turbinate and uh, so we respect all the middle meatus and the middle turbinate. We go above that just to su the superior uh, ethmoid and remove what is necessary for the operation. And this is the anterior cranial base. So really there was like no restriction to the, to the approach or to the maneuverability as far as a, a tumor resection. And this is the final view. So really a, a, as large as a, the conventional endoscopic approach. And this is the uh, reconstruction with, um, with an asoceptal flap. And this is the, uh, the final result. So tumors like this that can be performed endoscopically or can be performed um, in an open approach, we, uh, it really comes down to uh, very careful patient selection and try not to have bias towards one approach or the other. And a lot of, and sometimes it's also, apart from patient selection, also patient preference as well. And in tumors uh, like this, tumors of the tuberculum and planum, sometimes we don't have a favorable, um, a favorable approach. Uh, we don't have a favorable uh, pneumatization of this phenoid sinus. And in this case, this was a precellar type of sinus. So we can see that really uh, there's barely a, a prominence in the optic canals and the carotid artery. So it's going to, we know it's going to be a little bit harder to perform this approach. So the key is to go to midline and, and expose uh, the cell as a reference and then uh, go and go above uh, and you know, have a, a really wide exposure. And this is, uh, this is not a hook, this is a, a 90 degree feather knife. So it's actually um, a knife that really like cuts uh, towards you. So you can use it as a dissector and then as a knife. So this is uh, performing the bulking of this very fibrous tumor. And in this case, in the tumors from the platinum, we don't, sacrifice smell because the tumor is posterior to the cribriform plate. So the, the sense of smell should be, uh, should be preserved. So we are not sacrificing that. So here we see uh, the ACA is the ACOM, uh, the arteriocubner here, and it's still um, debulking the tumor uh, very carefully because we know that there's gonna be probably a vessel that is behind, and that is the, a branch of the uh, frontal uh, orbital artery that is feeding actually the tumor. We want to coagulate and uh, divide that branch. And then the key part of this is not only, so this is the suprachiasmatic area, the ACOMS, and this is lamina terminalis, and um, the final view. And the key part of this is really the reconstruction. So we don't have good reconstruction techniques. Uh, we cannot perform these approaches because the CSF leak, as we cannot suture the dura, there's no protection of skull base there, has to be really, really careful and with great patient selection. So this is a, we usually put a button uh, fascia ladder graft and then an asoceptal flap for these approaches. And then what, what I think the endoscopic and the nasal view gives you, this is a growing meningioma that is just attached, just medial to the optic nerve, I think gives a parallel view of the medial aspect of the optic nerves and the optic chias from, and the view of the optic chias from below is really the endonasal view. So, and this is a tumor that has part of uh, its uh, 
part of the tumor is, is in the nose. So it's a perfect uh, case for, in my opinion, for an endonasal uh, approach because the attachment is in the dura that we can actually remove. That is the dura just medial uh, to um, the optic uh, canal, goes into the medial aspect of the optic canal and we can, and part of the tumor is inside the nose. So again, in this case, we are not sacrificing here, uh, sacrificing olfaction because uh, we know that we are in the plane of tuberculum. So we uh, want to preserve the uh, cribiform plate and that preserves the sense of smell. So tumors like this, usually the outer arachnoid membrane uh, protects you. So you have to perform very gentle traction and uh, sharp dissection. And that uh, is performed with, um, uh, most of the times either with micro scissors or with a feather knife. So this is a feather knife that has a sharp end and really gives you uh, an unparalleled view of uh, the inferior and medial aspect of the optic canal. And then taking out the small piece that went to the optic canal. So this is an, a, a very uh, really advantageous uh, view of the uh, chasmatic branches. So this is the optic nerve. And this is the olfactory tract right there. So then just to finish, uh, to emphasize that also the lab is extremely important to show us new ways of uh, reconstruction, for instance. So again, from the lab to the OR, uh, Dr. Pinheiro um, had the idea to perform a, a a dissection around the maxillary artery to free the pedicle of the nasoceptal flap and really reach the posterior table of the frontal sinus, which is uh, impossible to reach otherwise with the nasoceptal flap. So this is applied to a case. And then we put together also this step-by-step uh, -step reconstructions in uh, a technique in uh, of endoscopic cranial based uh, uh, reconstruction in a, in a recently published book to see if we could help surgeons choose the best reconstruction technique for each approach. And I just want to thank my uh, team of uh, fellows. These are the full-time fellows we have in the lab. And without them and my colleagues, none, none of this could be possible. And I'm very proud of the team. Uh, we have a number of options if anyone is uh, interested as far as research fellowship, training periods, courses, uh, et cetera, at Mayo. And I just want to thank uh, the organization for the very kind invitation. It's really an honor for me to be here. And we're going to have our first CME course in Skull Base here at Mayo in a couple of weeks. And we look forward to the next one in uh, 2023. Thank you very much. How can I say? <laughs> and I say wonderful presentation. You see, the anatomy is the beginning. See, but you need to follow with new ideas, new concepts, new technology that's come, new way to, 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 to do and see the pathology. And at the end, the benefit is for the patient. You see all the steps that uh, Dr. Peller just showed us. See? The way that he start in the anatomy, the simulation, the 3D printing, the way to study the patient, the select the approach. See, it's very, very important. We have some difference in the concept of some approach, the technique, the, the approach that they use for some pathology, but it's different. It's, it's different. It's not the, the way that uh, want to discuss in this presentation here. I want to congratulate her for the excellent job. Congratulate for the didactic way that he present. And I'm sure that the hundreds of young neurosurgeons from Asia, from all over the world that you were watching her presentation 
now want to go, go do how to go to, to Mayo Clinic to do the fellowship and continue the work with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. It was a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Professor Suresh Nair, any comments? From what a great lecture, Professor Maria. Congratulations again from my side. So you told very correctly that there is no final frontier in surgical anatomy education. And I totally agree with that quote from Socrates. The more we know, the more we realize we know nothing. So actually that is both the teacher and pupil, they learn from every dissection, every surgery, every presentation. You stress the importance of 3D learning, 3D printing. You stress the anatomy very well. And also you told the correlation between endoscopic and microscopic views and you showed excellent infra and infrachiasmatic and suprachiasmatic case surgical videos. What a great lecture. Congratulations, Maria, again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? My co-host, Liu Boon Seng. Thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor, for a very nice uh, uh, educative uh, lecture. Uh, professor, I have uh, two questions to ask, Professor. Over the years, uh, in your involvement uh, in the anatomical lab with your, uh, with your uh, with fellows, uh, how, how what are the chances for you to identify new structure, new neural structure in your whole career? My first question. My second question, Professor, you are involved both in, in a cadaveric lab and also a live living uh, human in real operative uh, situation where the CSF all are, are there. So do you find that is there any differences in terms of relationship between anatomical structure in both cadaveric and also in the living human? Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, so we really is, is more than finding new structures, is finding new ways to perform what we always performed, but we know better how to. For instance, like, the technique of trying to minimize, see if we can go a step beyond. And instead of like destroying the whole nose, because it's just the corridor for the approach, there's nothing wrong with the nose. It really, we demonstrated with studies of uh, nasal flow uh, that patients who needed to have this operation was performed and was performed through the nose with that new minimal, if you will, approach, uh, not destroying as much nose, then we saw that had much, uh, a lot better uh, and more um, physiologic flow than patients who really had the middle turbinates resected and all the middle meatus resected. So it's something that really uh, improves patient care. Or for instance, uh, the technique to, um, to, en to enlarge, like kind of maximize the reach of the nasal septal flap. Sometimes in these cases, we have, for instance, traumas in the posterior, you know, that uh, need repair. So sometimes we have been able to not do a bifrontal craniotomy for a posterior table just because we are able to pull the nasal septal flap a lot more anterior. So are these, these techniques or the way to differentiate the subarquet and the variations with the labyrinthine artery, as an example of what I just showed, you know, has it improved patient care for, it has helped our patients because the more we know, the better our patients are going to be and have the outcome. So it's not about really recognizing completely new structures, but really new ways to perform better what we perform already. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Indeed, we had a great time listening and learning to you. And uh, we are extremely thankful to you for <laughs> teaching us. One question that I would like to put across is you show a medial frontal lesion. Uh, you went to transethmoid. Did you ever consider going transorbitally, which has come in a big way in the recent one or two years. What is your experience in this regard? So if the tumor is in the cribiform plate, 
I usually don't, if I have to do transcranial approach, uh, I, I do just a bicoronal incision. And the reason for that is because most patients have a really deep uh, creviform plate and it's hard for me to do. I use the supraorbital approach sometimes, but um, I feel like it depends on the case. But if it's like centered in the creviform plate, a lot of the times it's really hard to look deep into the uh, creviform fossa. And I think it's a little bit harder to see the olfactory on the other side. So in, that, in, in those cases, I, I tend to do the bifrontal approach, but I'm sure many people have many different opinions. So it depends on the case, I would I say. understand. So thank you very much. Uh, I think it's time we can move on to the second session. Uh, and uh, I would like to mention to our viewers that there are around 500 people who have joined for today's webinar. And uh, we sincerely thank everyone for that. And also Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. So our next speaker is Professor Jimmy Ming Chuan. And, uh, Unfortunately, our second chair is stuck in the operation theater. So may I request Professor Suresh Naya, sir, would you like to chair this session? Okay, I will chair, but then <laughs> once the real chairperson comes, I will just withdraw. Okay. okay. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, Professor Jimmy, you can start okay. your lecture. Good day to all of my dear friends in ACNS. Um, especially Professor uh, Barbara, we haven't met for several years. And thanks for inviting me. My name is Jim Zhuang, coming from the Southern Taiwan, the largest medical center, Kaohsiung Chunker Memorial Hospital. It would be a great honor for me to make a presentation of this webinar. I did my fellowship training between 2016 and 2018 in US major in Memphis with Professor Rick Book. I also spent time following the Professor Ali Christ in Little Rock, Samuel Albarra in Orlando, and Professor Ture in Istanbul. And also I, when I work in Memphis, learning neuro oncology knowledge with one of the best team in the world, a team of the St. Jude Children Research Hospital. This talk is dedicated to all my mentors, to their kind and warm mentoring. No words can express my gratitude. Today, it's a neuro oncology talk. I would like to have a sharing of our certain view of neuropathology diagnosis odyssey for 2021 WHO CNS tumor update. This talk was originally combined by two invited speech by Taiwan Society of Neuro-Oncology. And this is my outline today. As we know, the fifth edition of the WHO classification of the tumors of CNS published in 2021 the last year. It is the sixth version of the international standard for the classification of brain and spinal cord tumor. 15 years ago, when I was a resident, spending the time on the fourth edition published in 2007, I had a clear memory that the major classification solely based on the morphological feature and the simple stand. I can still find out my PowerPoint note, which shows how I learned the neuropathology at that time, such as um, serpentine necrosis and pseudopalisadine with GFAP stand, that means it's a GBM, or chicken wire-like blood vessels and fried egg-like cells with oligo-2 stand, that means it's an oligodendroglioma, and also diffuse astrocytoma, pedocyte astrocytoma. Each of them can find out their morphological feature. And you can see different landmark morphological feature in different stage of a glioma. At that time, CNS tumor classification has long been based on histological finding, supported by ancillary tissue-based tests. It is not very difficult for a neurosurgeon who resident. That was a good old days. But there's still some facts confused me at that a lot at that time. One is the differentiation of the oligodendrocyte or astrocyte, although each of them have different morphological features. But in fact, in the real world of the tumor slide, 
you can always see lots of cells have both morphological feature. And this is Ari Perry, the master neuropathologist work at UCSF. If you key in brain tumor rhapsody in the YouTube, you can find his pathological sound. It is very funny. I trim a very short part for you. Okay. There is no sound, Professor. No sound? No. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry that no sound you can hear. Okay, this is Ari and me in 2017. So it's not such simple. Let's just use morphology to identify um, any slide for a, a, a simple or single diagnosis. And another thing which bothered me is unclear cutting line between grade two and grade three glioma. You can, Sometimes you can make your diastolic staging in 10 and change your stage in the next slide with new finding. And the third fact is of all the survival curve do make difference from grade one to grade four. But you sometimes cannot explain some of your patient outcome based on their initial pathological staging. Such as we, we, don't, we all have experience of very worse grade two or very good GBM. So in 2005, the Stoop protocol was established for standard treatment of GBM. The same year, the expression of the MGMT gene was found to affect the treatment outcome of CCRT with tamadolomide. In 2009, the landmark article in AJM told us the mutation of IDH1 and IDH2 can strongly affect the tumor biology and patient outcome. Also see in the Science Journal. In 2013, the Cancer Genomic Atlas for Cancer Analysis bring us the molecular world, which changed the rule of the tumor identification and staging. We start to understand that tumor morphology under microscope do not fully reflect biology and survival prognosis. The new methods of a molecular marker will redefine the diagnosis information and explore the advanced category of tumor classification. Based on this new advance, in 2014, all the masters of neuropathologists around the world had a consensus facing to the new major question. How can non-historical criteria be used to enhance typing and grading of the human brain tumors? That is so-called homeland consensus. That this add molecular information as the new layer from the four neuropathological diagnosis. For example, with a format diagnosis of a medulla blastoma, the four neuropathological workup and diagnosis will contain integrated diagnosis, historical classification, WHO grading, and the molecular information. So the new edition of the WHO CNS tumor classification public in 2016 integrate the morphology of molecular feature. It is a revolution. And we fit this revolution to the clinical outcome and tumor behavior in real world. They make a big change. Following 2016, the information explosion with the new molecular finding and the new clinical creation. This change is so fast that the master of the neuropathology around the world decide to provide forum to evaluate the recommend proposed change to future sense tumor classification. What we call is C impact now. The now means not official WHO. The C-impact report almost every couple months that accumulates seven C-impact now update report quickly between 2018 and 2020. 
and each C impact now update report had the topic. In 2021, the last year, a summary of those C impact now was published on Neuroncology. And this become the fifth edition of the WHO classification of tumor of the CNS. But before, before going through this new version of the international guideline, I would like to share about some cases first with my patient, which reflect the impact of the permanent pathology and the frozen section to us neurosurgeon. The first case is a 38 years old male with incidental finding of brain tumor. The local hospital only did a biopsy, which report diffuse astrocytoma. He was referred to me for second look surgery and following adjuvant treatment. Will you do the surgery? I don't. The tumor location and image patient did not look like diffuse astrocytoma. Without symptom, I request for pathological review first from the local hospital. Not surprisingly, it is not diffuse astro, it's a pedose astrocytoma. So I just watched him for regular image follow-up. This lesson told us that the true grading of the permanent pathology helped us make correct decision that fit related treatment protocol. The second case is a 24 years old female with visual field defect. The initial image shows a deep temporal parietal enhancing tumor. My colleague did a subtotal resection and pathology report a pedose astrocytoma, and the tumor come back in nine months later. And then he referred to my service. I did. I did an image survey workup to seem like more malignancy. And I did a near total resection with mapping. And to my surprise, my pathology still report the pedose astrocytoma without B-RAF mutation. Actually, I did not believe it was true, but under microscope, the slide really looked like pedose astrocytoma. So finally, I sent the slide to my mentor, Professor David Addison at St. Jude Children Research Hospital and they did a full molecular workup. The diagnostic conclusion indicate an unusual pedose astoma, which is WHO grade one, and an IDH Y type diffuse astrocytoma, which indicate WHO grade two. So this is not a benign tumor. I finally put her to radiotherapy and following PCV chemotherapy. So this is a great lesson that indicate the molecular marker not only provide prognostic factor and define the true diagnostic information for correct grading treatment protocol. The third part of today's outline is the impact of the frozen pathology. Another case of 71-old male with left side hemiparesis. The image show a multiple enhancing lesion look like malignancy, but I'm not sure what it is and surgical feeling did not like GBM. So I sent a frozen section before ready resection. The frozen report me a high grade glioma. So I took all the lesion off in my best. However, the permanent pathology report a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. I feel like trembling because lymphoma are viewed as not surgical tumor. Although recent articles start to discuss the resection indication for surface lymphoma, but you feel that you have been stopped. Incorrect frozen section will make you wrong surgical decision. The fourth case is a 65 old female with progressive unsteady gait and riding weakness for one month. He was on wheelchair status due to myopathy. The MR showed a retricted enhancing intrapunctin tumor. It looked like malignancy, but I still have some aspect to be benign. I did a televela approach to the dorsal side of the pons. Plan to approach the tumor from infra or supra collector safe zone. I did brainstem facial mapping 
and hypochrosomatic, and entry from infra collector safe zone first. But the frozen report negative for malignancy, so abandoned and entry from superior collector zone. The frozen report high grade glioma. So finally, I did a subtotal resection. I told my resident, if Frozen told me this is low grade, I will try my best to resect it all. But if Frozen told me this is high grade, subtotal is enough. Further resection did not show more benefit and maybe more risk. The resection ratio is 75%. The finally, the pathology, the initial diagnosis was report glioblastoma with IDH wild type, but this is not correct in the new classification. In the new classification, it is so called intrapounding double H wild and IDH wild high grade glioma. It's also WH grade 4 and is worse than GBM. The case five, uh, our last case. 29 years old male with progressive trunk ataxia, impairment of the vibration and position sense and urine incontinence. The image showed a strong enhancement located on dorsal column. I was initially think it might be mixopapillary ependymoma. When I did the surgery, the lesion feel like tumor with hard texture and necrotic fissure and very clear plan from tumor margin to neighboring spinal cord. But I did not resect it because it did not look like a bending moment. I stopped the surgery, tried to send frozen section. The pathology did not make clear confirmation initially. Initial pathology showed a typical cell. Some of the surgery maybe start resection, but I'm not. I feel uncomfortable. So I keep sending larger frozen, totally. I wait two hours for full frozen section. And finally, my pathology made conclusion. It is not a malignancy. It is an acute or chronic inflammation process with granuloma. So I stopped the surgery and closed the wound. 10 days later, my pathology report an acute and chronic inflammation with foreign body type monoculeus giant cells with abundant corporea amylacea inside of the cell. So this is an autoimmune experience. This is not a malignancy disease or surgical disease. For a long diagnostic journey, this patient was finally identified as GBE1, GBE1 mutation and diagnosed as a rare autosomal recessive disease, so-called adult polyglucosan body disease. What is this? This is, is not a topic we discussed today, but thanks God I did not resect his inflammatory spinal cord due to keep sending frozen section to make resection decision clear. So what is the destination of our neuropathology journey? There are three points. The permanent pathology make the following treatment solid. An integration of the morphology and molecular feature is now all needed. A frozen section help you make correct surgical decision before your resection. Now back to our new version of the international guideline, what a surgeon need to know and what change. First, the grading number are moved from Roman number to Arabic numbers. They make decreased error and fit the general pathological naming system. Then some naming rules are changed. New naming system cancer the unspecific words such as anaplastic. There are no anaplastic astrocytoma anymore. The name become astrocytoma grade three with IDH status declaration. Some tumor naming need mark the grading. And GBM only indicate IDH wild type adult grade for astrocytoma. Because it is real make big difference between IDH wild type and IDH mutant. So if IDH status is mutant in grade four, we do not call him GPM anymore. We call him IDH mutant grade four astrocytoma. 
The new naming system with molecular identification make the dissolve more clear. So in the past time, you can see this is a famous paradigm and it shift to the clear cut for the clinical physician. I have um, my paradigm and I try to show you in this table. So you can see in grade two and grade three with IDH mutant and 1P19Q colliditic. It's an oligo and it has grade two and grade three. If it's still IDH mutant, but the EP, uh, the 1P19Q are non colliditic then yes, it is not oligo. It becomes diffuse astro and it had grade two, grade three, and grade four. If it is wild type, then the grade four IDH wild type become GBM. And some glioma was diagnosed as grade four only with molecular identification, such as CDKN2A homozygous deletion or H3 status, K27M a lot. And diffuse hemisphere glioma, H3.3 G34 mutant, or in most of Peter's high grade glioma. The biomarker for are divided for two tables. The one group is called diastolic base marker. It can change your grading. And another part is looser oncogenic marker. It has prognostic value, but do not change the grading. So back to the summary of the 2021 WHO publication, you can see there are two tables. The table one shows the diastolic base marker, such as IDH, H sign status, and 1P90Q status. And table two shows the looser oncogenic marker, such as ATRAC, TP53, um, EGFR, such as. And this is the type and the subtype. And some of the tumors, such as meningioma, have only one type with single entry. So back to our summary of the C impact now for seven update report. Let's review all of them. In the report one, it have two naming identification. One's called NOS. It means not otherwise specific. And another word is NEC. It means not airware classified. What does it mean? That means if you only have uh, only have histological diagnosis and do not work the molecular marker well, uh, sometimes you have not enough money or enough um, uh, technological support, then your diagnosis have to show an OS. So you can see in 2016, the diagnosis have an OS part in every diagnosis section. And if you do the full molecular work and you find a new group, that do not fit on the current WHO classification system, you can put him as NEC, not airwise classified. It means you are so great. I, I, let's show one of the um, example from every Paris lecture. Um, he got a patient from, all, from other hospital and did not work well with um, lack of the molecular marker. So initial diagnosis are put the GBM with NOS, but after the whole molecular workup, the diagnosis become the adult type high grade glioma with untracked fusion. This is not the current WHO classification. So we put NEC. And there, the new entity that is not yet part of the WHO classification. In, in, in St. Jude, we can usually see that a full diagnosis without definite WHO grading. That's because the current evidence did not um, decide the real staging for this kind of molecular marker. If we collect enough NEC number on the same group, then finally we'll check outcome. And maybe the new version of the C impact now will announce the grading. Uh, in the next edition of the WHO classification, it will be the rule. 
So in C pack impact now two, that's talking about the grading for the H sign status, the histone. So something like the diffuse midnight glioma, if you see the H sign K27 mutation, or diffuse hemisphere glioma, um, you, you, you found the H3.3 G34 mutant. You can directly put the grading to grade four. And actually it's worse than GBM. And another part of the C impact now too, if you find a patient with IDH mutant with ad track loss and TP53 positive, then it is impossible to be 1P90Q correlation. You can save your money not to do in the fish. So there's a part in grade four that you can just diagnose under the molecular marker. But it had to fit diffuse, midline, glioma. On the CIMPAC now update report three, they're talking about bad grade two. All of this grade two, bad grade two are all grade four. So what kind, some traditional grade two are so worse. So we can find such as IDH. You can see if the IDH mutant for grade three and a astrocytoma as previous staging, the Median survival are more than 10 years. But another part, if the IDH wild type diffuse astrocytoma, it's only grade two, but the median survival are 4.8 years. That make no logic. It doesn't make sense. And another important part is the same molecular marker have different importance in different type of glioma, such as IDH status. In wild type GBM, the IDH wild type is so worse as also in grade two and grade three. But in grade one, such as PLC Astro, it make no meaning. So this is two different entity in the group. One is diffuse glioma and one is circumscribed astrocytic gliomas. About the bad grade two, there's already some neuropathology found, like third, EGFR, MYB, shows important impact, such as chromosome seven gain and 10 loss, show poor prognosis. You can see the survival curve, the third and chromosome seven gain, 10 loss, and H3 mutation are all very worse. So finally, um, the C impact report, they conclude the third chromosome C GAN, seven GAN, 10 loss and EGFR. Uh, and whether you, you, you historically diagnose diffuse astral, you can directly put in as grateful or one of them are rich the criteria. And the C impact four, you can see it's around, it's talking about pediatric glioma. It's very complicated. I would not discuss the detail here. And the update five is talking about the IDH mutant bias. There's still some bad marker that you can put IDH mutant as grade four. The most famous is CDKN2A, the homozygous deletion. If you found that, even in IDH mutant, you can put it as grade four, even without microvascular perforation or necrosis. And the C impact now, the sex report that discussed the other tumors. In 2021, they add 22 new entity and revised 13 terminology. And the C impact now, the report seven, are talking about ependymoma. The right now ependymoma become very complicated. We have 10 subtypes with grade one to grade three. So back to the conclusion to the odyssey of the neuropathology journey. We can, we, we all know right now, the traditional histology findings supported by ancillary tissue-based test is not 
enough today. Integration of the molecular fusion become very important. And we have to fit on the clinical outcome and tumor behavior. That makes right now the neural pathology very complicated. And if you do not work well, you will be become the NOS group. If you do the work job very good, you will become an EC group. And right now, there are also some genomic-based treatment program in all kinds of tumor that have many disease gene drug correlation. So why neurosurgeon need to understand neuro-oncology? That's because the sore surgery cannot treat most of the brain tumor. And especially we have BBB problem that we cannot concentrate. The drug delivery are a major problem that even you got a good drug in your molecular pathway, but your drug cannot going through the BBB to the tumor. And some like GBN, it's a tumor heterogeneity. So what you take off and present at pathology did not show the residual tumor's behavior. And the third, right now, the only proof um, the temozoli had resistance. And in the, in the immunoregulation, the immunotherapy, usually the brain becomes a cold response. So we need to understand not only surgery, but the tumor biology that will make us become neuron co surgeon I thank you for your attention. But thanks again for inviting me. Hope to have chance to share other topic in the future. I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the section. Thank you very much. What, a, what again, another great lecture, uh, Jimmy, really for a neurosurgeon to master all this. I, I know how much effort you would have put and you started by telling that you had great teachers like Frederick Boop, Ali Kirst, and Toure. And then you told us about when you started your career, it was just based on morphology. Then you, uh, in 2009, you told the IDH markers came. 2014, the Harlem classification came, where integrated diagnosis was important. And then 2016, C impact. And now you told about the new version in 2021. You stress the importance of molecular markers because they provide prognostic, uh, they are the real prognostic markers. And you highlighted five cases. First was, I think, a, a posterior fossa tumor, which was reported uh, grade two, and it turned out to be pilotitic. Next was uh, a tumor uh, which was supratendorial, which was uh, uh, reported pilocytic, it turned out to be high grade. Then you told about a case of lymphoma. Uh, then you told about a spinal case, uh, which was mixopapillary. Turned out to be a new illness, which I, I have never heard till now. You told about ABPD disease. And the fourth, I think you told about a brainstem lesion. Excellent cases. The importance of molecular markers was uh, very much uh, there for all the cases. And you told that now, a diagnosis based marker and looser oncogenic marker. That is how they look at in 2021. Just one question uh, that case of that uh, spinal cord lesion, the mixopapillary uh, ependymoma, how common it is in the uh, high cervical area, and all, probably mostly it is in uh, cord equine area only. But your case, you know, used went on uh, telling that it was a mixopapillary ependymoma. That I am not very sure how much common a mixopapillary ependymoma can occur in the uh, cord. Usually it is in the cord equine area. Great lecture. And I learned a lot because most of it I was not knowing. But I learned a lot from this lecture. Thanks, Professor. Uh, the great, great talk, Jimmy. Thank you for a great summary of today's talk. Thank you very much, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Suresh Nasser. Always vibrant and elegant and wonderful comments. Uh, Professor Jimmy, I would like to ask one question. Like, where do we draw our line as a neurosurgeon? Because so much of information is probably impossible to gather while doing a surgery. So is there any easier way that you get into 
conclusion that this is this and uh, the recommendations are those because WHO guidelines keep on changing. So are there any practical tips that you would like to give us? As a young neurosurgeons are very much looking forward to hear and learn this lecture. Maybe you can give some practical tips. Thank you very much for your comment. I do have some response for the young neurosurgeon. Um, before my talk, the, uh, the professor had presented the importance of the anatomy. That's correct, anatomy is so important. Uh, but uh, right now, the current neurosurgeon have more to have learned. Uh, beyond anatomy, they have to learn the neural image. They have learned, um, they have learned pathology. They have learned neuro oncology. They have to catch all of the information that they finally can become the most benefit to your patient. If you just do very good at surgery, you will be only a surgeon, not the full physician. You can always do very good resection, but not always a benefit to your patient. So in the current year of the young neurosurgeon, they have to learn a lot that not only know how to surgery. It's a big word. I give bless on them. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It is easier said than done. Too much to study and too much to learn for the young neurosurgeons. So thank you very much, Professor Jimmy Ming Chuang, for this wonderful lecture and extremely grateful to Professor Suresh Nair for sharing this at a very short notice. I would like to conclude this officially. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yo Pukato, I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Maria Selda Paris and Professor Jimmy Ming Jen Chuang as well as Jess, Professor Louis Boba and Professor Suresh Nair for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would like to express my sincere thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel and today we have around 500 people who have joined us live on various streaming platforms. Also special thanks to my co-host Liu Boon Singh for joining me today. So until we all meet on Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.